Thank you, Tom. Uh, from what I just heard as we were closing the prayer, they were cheering down the hallway for some reason. I don't like to be left behind. I think we should cheer, all of us right now at the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah! We're going to let them know something's going on down here in this room. I'm uh, thrilled to be with you this afternoon, to be with Gary once again. We've had the privilege to work uh, together for the last three plus years on this particular project that uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about this afternoon. Now, uh, you'll also see from the title slide and from the handouts that uh, you have, if you came in and didn't get one for some reason, just hold your hand up and we'll have somebody come around, give you an outline of the session for today. You notice that I have an event page or session web page. So uh, if you'd like to, you can go to that page later on. It's uh, www.worldvieweyes.org slash NACC17.html. So for those of you who do that kind of thing, uh, the handouts for this session, including the one with the blanks that you have in your hand, as well as, the one, as a handout that's got the blanks filled in for you. So if you're super lazy, or you get behind and you don't get the blanks filled in, you can go to the website and download either one of those handouts as well as the slides that we'll be using this afternoon. Those are already posted there for you. And later when we have video and audio recordings of this session, those will be available there as well. So I invite you to visit uh, that when you have opportunity. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. This is such a desperately needed issue for us to address the question about doubt. And what we've decided to do in the session this afternoon is to develop the metaphor of uh, preparing the soil for the seed. Now, we talk an awful lot about spreading the seed and that is desperately needed for us, but especially coming from farm territory, as I do, as Tom does, it's amazing how much time the farmers spend getting the soil ready before they even get the planters in the field. And that analogy should be driven home to us. And so we're going to focus on that particular thought as we look at the parable of the sower. Now, one thing is I was just doing some background reading. I'm not going to do exposition of the text from the Gospels on this, but it's just very interesting and enlightening to do a comparative and contrasting analysis of what the three Gospels have to say. For example, you could do this relatively easily. Go to a web page that's got some Bible text and just select the Bible text. You could paste it into a Word document or a text document and then see what they say side by side. So what you're looking at here, just as a model of what you might do, is what Matthew has to say about this parable and Mark and Luke. I've only got part of that passage posted, uh, displayed for you just now, but it shows you what you can do. There's just an enormous amount of insight that you can gain from the teaching of Jesus on what we refer to as the parable of the sower. And in many ways, it's very simple. That's one of the things about the teaching of Jesus. Very simple. And this particular parable uh, is also made plain to them. I mean, they wonder why he's teaching in parables and he gives some uh, you know, explanation about uh, you know, for some that's gonna be harder to understand and for others, they'll be able to comprehend what he's trying to communicate. But for the most part, he tells you what the basic meaning of this parable is. He tells you who the seed represents. He tells you about the soil and the various kinds of soil. And most of you know this pretty well, I would think. You know that there are four basic kinds of soil that are talked about. In uh, these passages, there's a uh, seed that was dropped along the path on rocky soil, on thorny soil, on good soil. And then Jesus unpacks what this means in terms of uh, the extent to which fruit is actually born from the seed that is planted. So you can see in this little diagram uh, how the outcome is produced. The birds eat that which is placed on the path. No fruit, because the seed is gone very quickly. Rocky places where you got a little bit of soil, but not any depth for the roots to take hold. And so it springs forth quickly, but that also has problems. There's no root, sun comes out, withers it away. No real harvest or fruit born from that. 
Some of the seed is dropped upon thorny soil and uh, that seed arises, but it's in the midst of all kind of thorny junk and that chokes it out. Now Jesus gives a further explanation as to how the surroundings affect the fruit bearing. And some of the things that he talks about is how we can be worried by the, our, the details of life, this life. We're concerned about what other people think of us. I mean, he, he mentions some possibilities about how uh, the culture around us, the soil around us, you might say, has a direct and sometimes adverse effect upon how much fruit the seed that we plant actually produces. Now, as I said, I'm not going to spend much time beyond what I've already said about the text itself, but I certainly invite you to do that when you have an opportunity to just let the text speak to you in what Jesus is teaching about the seed and about these different kinds of soil. But I want to draw attention to some important points from those texts. One of those points has to do with the seed. In one of the passages, Jesus identifies it as good seed. And the seed is the word of God. And the son of man is also involved in planting that seed. So it's good seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. If there is a problem with the harvest, then the problem has to come after the goodness of the seed itself. So the process of the sower, where it's placed, and the kind of ground that is produced there. There's also a spiritual battle that is being referred to here. In several of these passages, Jesus specifically refers to the devil or to, the, or to Satan. So Jesus cast this not just as an agricultural metaphor, but this is a spiritual battle in which we are engaged. And then he also identifies the importance of understanding. In a couple of these places, they just didn't understand properly. So if we're going to have fruit born from the seed, we need to make sure that people properly understand what is being communicated. And that's a big part of the whole process of preaching and evangelism and Christian apologetics to clarify what the, the real uh, uh, seminal core of that seed uh, is all about. And then, of course, the importance of spreading the seed. And we're getting sermons and teachings and all that kind of stuff at the convention and other place. Preach the word, plant the seed. And I don't want to minimize any of that. That is also desperately important. But what strikes me in this passage is the implied obligation to prepare the soil. Jesus identifies three types of soil that are tremendously problematic, that do not bear fruit as he intended. And that implies to me that I and that we as a church and as individual Christians and as Christian families have the prerogative and the responsibility to do everything that we can to make sure that the soil on which the seed is placed is good soil. After all, the objective is not just to sprout some seed leaves. Hey, we got some here! I remember when I was a kid, you know, trying a little seed planting and what the excitement that came, you know, when I was very young to see the seed that I planted in this little pot. It actually started growing up. And some of us are prone to celebrate. Yeah, we got some here. No, we got nothing. The objective is to have fruit from the seed. And so just because people might be initially excited and joyful about receiving the seed, it doesn't do any good if the cultural sun ends up scorching them to the point that they don't consider it any longer and they don't bear any fruit. So the objective is to bear fruit. It's not just to have excitement at the sprout coming up or to have a plant that starts to appear but doesn't have deep enough root in the soil because the soil is not adequately prepared for it. You get the point? The obligation to a great extent falls on us in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. And we can go one or two extremes here. We can just say, well, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Let him do it. And the Holy Spirit does have that task. But our responsibility and privilege is also to do everything that we can to prepare the soil for the soil to bear fruit from that seed. And I believe that our cultural conditions, in fact, lead us 
to a situation where there are all kinds of different soil in our culture and we need to do everything that we can to modify that soil to make it more receptive to a fruit bearing seed. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the soil of our culture. There are some statistics that you'll see in the handout, some blanks to fill in, and, and if you can write fast, you can follow me with this, and if you can't write fast enough, then you can download the handout with the answers on it. Aren't you thankful for that? Say, thank you, God, for technology when it works, and I can download it and things like that. So let me talk a little bit about the soil of our culture that's having an adverse effect upon the fruit bearing capacity of the good seed that we are planting in the minds and the hearts of people. Now, there is, perhaps you know, there is the rise of the nuns. I love to characterize it this way. <laughs> now, it's a little bit misleading. I'm not talking about, you know, the special attire or anything. But I am talking about the fastest growing demographic group in America. And it's also fast growing around the world. The nuns is a term that has been devised by various sociologists to refer to that group of people who have no religious affiliation at all. They're not Catholic, they're not Lutheran, Baptist, or any version of Christian. They're not Hindu, they're not Buddhist, they're not Muslim. They're not nothing. Oh, that's bad English, isn't it? I just tell my students, I'm the professor, I can use it incorrectly if I want to. As long as I know the difference. So that's, that, that's the real difference. So we got the rise of the nuns. Well, this is a fast-growing group. To give you an impressionistic idea of that, look at the studies here. Starting in 1990, it's eight, about 8%. 2007, it increases to 15% of the American population. 2012, it's at nearly 20%. In 2014, according to Pew Research, it rises to nearly 23%. That's almost one in, what's that? Help me with the math here. Isn't that one in four, almost? And it's growing at that kind of rate. To give you some idea of the, the number of people involved, it's an increase from 2007 to 2014 of 56 million people added to this category that are not affiliated with any religious group whatsoever. That's part of the culture on which we're trying to plant soil. Now, when you look at this among the younger group, the so-called millennials, the 1829 group, look how quickly this has grown. Starting in 2007, from 11 percent, it doubles in 2000, or from 1990, it doubles in 2007 to 22 percent. It jumps to 32 percent in 2012. The more recent data on this divide the millennials into the older and the younger millennials. The, the older ones, 34 percent of American millennials aged 25 to 33 are in this none category. The younger millennials, it's 36%. Now, on the one hand, in a very broad sense, people who have a biblical worldview or are born again, 45% of Americans have a, a, a born again, that's very, very generic, by the way. I mean, it's like if your heart's beating twice in the same thing and you look at a Bible once every once. And no, it's a very broad definition of what born again is. But according to Barna Research, when you focus upon those that have a genuine biblical worldview, it's only 9% of adults. <coughs> Among teenagers, it drops to 2%. And when you focus on that age group from 18 to 23 years old, I can hardly even show it on the graph here because it's less than one half of 1%. Now that gives you some idea of the changing nature of the soil of our culture. The more recent research has incorporated the term integrated disciples. This is a study just released in February of 2017 from the American Culture and Faith Institute. They incorporate this term integrated disciples, those who not only believe things that are biblically grounded, but they actually behave that way, generally speaking. You know, you can believe something and then you just do, completely do something else. So they're trying to identify those who have some behavior that accords with their profession of biblical belief. Look what they come up with in terms of age group. Those 65 and older, 
17% of Americans are in that integrated disciple stand, uh, category. Those aged 50 to 64, it drops to 15%. The 30 to 49 age group, it drops to 7%. The 18 to 29, this is the millennial group, that group stands at 4% of Americans in that age group are classified as ha are being integrated disciples. Now, it's alarming that many young people who are coming up in our churches, considered as youth with a Christian background, are asking tough questions as they come up. But unfortunately, those questions often go with a resistant ear, like it's inappropriate for, those, for them to ask those questions. And that's one reason why we started this Room for Doubt project to try to change the mood in Christian circles and churches to communicate the idea, a biblical idea, I contend, that it's okay to have tough questions. It's okay even to express doubt about the faith. And while we've got these young people in the church, it's time to let them and encourage them to ask the tough questions in a non-intimidating environment. I'll give you some idea of this. Those who have wandered away from their Christian heritage later report that 38% of them say at some point as they were coming up, they significantly doubted their faith. When asked, when, when asked a question about whether they felt like they could ask their most pressing questions in church, 36% of them say they felt like they couldn't even ask those questions in church. Well, if you're not going to ask the questions, you're not going to get any answers or responses. And so I want to challenge you, when you go back home to your home church this weekend and you see the young people around, just keep in mind, a lot of those young people have tough questions about their faith. And they may not be sharing them with anybody because they haven't been made to feel like it's okay to do so. In fact, 32% of them say that they felt, at least at one time, of completely rejecting their parents' faith. It's no wonder, then, that the statistics on this are terribly alarming. According to David Kinneman, who's the head of the Barner Research Group, uh, particularly as expressed in his fine book, You Lost Me, nearly 60% of churched young people are wandering away from their Christian heritage in their 20s uh, to become disengaged from religious or Christian life. And then Drew Dyke has done some alarming research as well. In an open-ended kind of a survey with a question, what was one of the key factors that prompted you to wander away from the faith and abandon it? And here's what they said. The most frequently mentioned factor by deconverts was this. Sharing their burgeoning doubts with a Christian friend or family member only to receive trite, unhelpful answers. So it's no one... I mean, here's the problem, folks. We don't let them ask the questions, and then when they do, they don't get any good answers to the questions. That's kind of a double whammy, isn't it? And so why are these young people leaving our fold, wandering away? Well, I've got some bulleted items in your handout. This is an even longer list, but I want you to notice a couple of the items that are key factors here. One of them, last one, no room for doubt. Especially young people don't like Christians thinking that they've got all the answers. Now listen, I've got three graduate degrees in philosophy, including a PhD from a mainline Big Ten University in philosophy. I know a little bit about knowledge claims. And if you think Christians have got all the answers, please come and chat with me a little bit. Because we don't have all the answers in that kind of definitive, authoritative kind of fashion. Now, we've got sufficient answers on the things that matter, that are most important and critical. But let's not communicate to young people or anybody else that we can be arrogant with our level of knowledge claims here. We want to open the atmosphere for open conversation. And that's what Gary will share with us uh, a great deal about that. So uh, no answers for the opposition, shallow belief system. I just talked to a student, he's a preacher here at a Kansas City church, but he's doing some graduate work with me uh, at uh, Lincoln Christian University. 
And uh, he just moved six months ago from being a youth minister to a preacher at one of the churches here in Kansas City. He said, well, man, no more pizza now. We, we, I can't play the games the way I you know, play with those kids. Now, there's nothing wrong with pizza. In fact, I like pizza. If you had some good hot pizza, I'd have some between the sessions. You could share with me. That's part of Christian fellowship. So I like all that stuff and fun and games and everything else. The research shows that nearly 90% of church young people say that they had a fun or positive experience with church. But less than 10% of them have a biblical worldview. So we're not making the connection here somehow. There is a problem with that. We have to do more than have a shallow belief system and we need to start earlier than after they get out of high school, into college, and beyond. So how can we prepare the soil? Well, this particular project called Room for Doubt was designed in great part to try to address that question, to try to change the mood in churches and parachurches and in families, Christian families, to encourage questions to be asked and even doubts to be expressed. The fact is, if we're honest with ourselves, we all have tough questions. And rather than conceal it or ca camouflage it, we ought to be honest and candid with it, with, especially with our young people. They will appreciate and honor our candor and our honesty. And so we designed this program, Room for Doubt. We had a gentleman come to us out of the clear blue at Lincoln Christian University. We had no affiliation with him prior. He's in his 70s now. He, he was raised nominally in a Christian church background. He lost his faith when he was in college and then came back in in a superficial way into the church. But it wasn't until he got into his 50s, age-wise, that he came across the material that dealt with Christian apologetics, showing why the Christian faith really makes the most sense of any other alternative. And it turned him on. And so he's been doing a variety of things for the last 20-some years. But he came to us and basically said this, we got a problem. we got to do something. We're losing our kids. And so we got our heads together and tried to work with Gary and with Mark Middleberg and with Lee Strobel and come together with some, some strategies for how we might address this, this series of very, very tough issues facing our culture and facing our church. So this is room for doubt. Its primary mission is to provide an environment to encourage questions, to address doubts and strengthen faith. And so I, I invite you, encourage you to spread the word about our website where all of our materials can be accessed. Um, Roomfordoubt.com is where you can find it. One of the unique things about this website is that we allow uh, people to submit questions on the website and then we will respond to those questions. So here's a place on the home page of the website, a little spot right down here where, you, where they can type in their message or their question and if it's something that is uh, shared by other people then we'll post a, a response with considerations of that and then include that on the website. We got a Facebook page that kind of keeps people in touch with us through that particular venue. But one of the things that we've developed that we want to focus on for the rest of the session today is a six week message and curriculum series for churches and parachurches. Uh, what we've done is just take six of the fundamental themes or claims of the Christian faith and develop message manuscripts, sermon manuscripts, and an adult discussion curriculum and a youth discussion guide uh, for churches and for multi-church area-wide campaigns to do this. Right now we've had about 90 churches either do this six-week series or they have acquired the material and then the, or, or they're in the process of implementing it. And the, I'm not embarrassed or ashamed about saying we are promoting that series right now. We think that we're offering some very good material. We deal with the upside of doubt. We deal with the existence of God. We deal with the nature of the Bible and its reliability. We talk about whether we can really know that Jesus is God's son. How do we know that? What about the issue of evil and the problem of suffering? What about tolerance? How can you advocate truth of Christianity 
and yet at the same time be tolerant. These are some big, big topics, aren't they? So that provides the backbone for all of this. The six-week series materials have been developed uh, primarily by three people that have been cohorts, you might say, for a long time. Uh, all three of these guys were on staff at Willow Creek uh, Community Church years and years ago, and they still are close working colleagues, and uh, we have been privileged to work with all three of them. Mark Middleberg uh, served as the executive producer for the six-week series, wrote uh, uh, and revised most of the message manuscripts. Uh, Gary Poole, who we'll share with us in just a moment, moment, did the discussion guides for the adults as well as the youth discussion guide. Lee Strobel contributed two of the six sermons for this series and has uh, consulted with us in this project. And I have been uh, involved in providing some additional resource materials, uh, even uh, providing college class uh, work that can be done or follow up next step kind of materials, both in writing as well as video produce materials as well. Now, this material comes with discussion guide, adult discussion guide, as well as a youth discussion guide. And we got videos of all sorts that can be used. Videos for leadership training, those who are leading small groups. We got videos for sermon bumpers, discussion starters. We got all kinds of graphics to use, the proper fonts that we want you to use, marketing materials. And then uh, once you acquire the material, we'll give you access to uh, another web page that gives additional recommended resources, videos, and other online materials. Everything is in downloadable form. Now we've got a modest charge that we're doing for this just to keep maintenance of the website and some further program development, but all of these materials can be quickly and easily and cheaply downloaded and used um, by anybody in the world. And we've already had several out of country, Gary, I don't know if you knew this, several out of the country who have uh, used this. I just hand delivered this series, by the way, to a Chinese church last week gave it to the preacher and said this is yours you use it however you can in china translate it and adapt it because there are seekers there i was terribly impressed with the faith commitment of devoted disciples of jesus in mainland china while i was there well one of the things that we did was to do a, a seekers uncensored panel people who are not christians who were willing to come into a church on a Sunday morning and be videotaped and go through a number, a number of other videotaping sessions and just share their questions, share their doubts. That's some of the videos that we have available as a part of this Room for Doubt series. So at this point, look at how handsome this guy is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you to Gary Poole. A very fine evangelist. Thank Gary. Rich, good job. Thank you very much. It's good to be with all of you. And thank you, Doubting Thomas, for being here as well. So for the rest of our session, what we want to do is just talk to you about this Room for Doubt group uh, and how to facilitate a group for non-Christians. And uh, it, I've been uh, teaching Christians for many, many years on how to start these groups. And I'm absolutely convinced that anyone can lead one of these groups. You can start one of these groups and you can facilitate a discussion with non-Christians. And so what I'd like to do is just give you an overview of these groups and what it means to facilitate a group like this. I want to define it. I want to give you some reasons why they're so effective. And then what I'd like to do is open it up for any questions you have about how to start up one of these groups. So if you would all do me a favor and just humor me, and just flip a little switch in your mind. Have you, you, all, you all know you have like a switch, right? It's on or off. And if you flip it on and say, okay, I would like to facilitate one of these groups. If you, if you would humor me and say, I'm gonna start one of these groups, then you'll be more geared to ask me some really good questions about how to actually start those. And then when you leave, you can maybe turn the switch off if you want. But I hope you don't. Because what I hope I'm going to do in the next half hour is give you a vision and an inspiration and a motivation to start one of these groups for non-Christians and watch what God does. In fact, I was just talking to Tom right before we started the session, and he told me he led one of these groups. And he facilitated them using the curricula that we wrote and so forth. 
And uh, if you want to find out how his group went, talk to him right after the session, okay? And uh, so, so th think about any questions that come to your mind. And again, think of, think of them as in the sense that you are going to start one of these groups, okay? You ready? You're going to humor me? You're going to start one of these groups, right? I see some nods shaking. Yes? Yes? Okay, good, good. All right, so if you look in your handout, um, there's a little uh, outline of these groups. Now, you can call these groups whatever you like. Uh, we've been calling them spiritual discovery groups. You can call them room for doubt groups. Room for Doubt Groups, I think, is an awesome title, and we've got the curricula for Room for Doubt to help you facilitate a discussion for, for non-Christians and for Christians who have doubts. So you can call it whatever you want, but you don't necessarily um, call them a seeker small group to non-Christians because they won't know what it is. So I'll talk to you about inviting people to these groups and what do you say when you invite people. But um, for our purposes, we're calling them spiritual discovery groups. Now, just as a side this called Seeker Small Groups, and this came out several years ago, and I walked through the uh, bookstore or book area over there, and they've got a whole bunch of these books out there, so if you wanted to get more details, this is ev everything you need to know on starting one of these groups from A to Z, okay? This is the details of it, but I'm going to give you the uh, quick version, okay? So first, let's define these groups. Spiritual discovery groups are informal, non-threatening, Rich talked about how important it is for people to feel safe. They're non-threatening, ongoing, spiritual discussions designed primarily for non-Christians and facilitated by one or two trained Christians. All right, so here's the idea. These are small groups made up of four to six to eight to ten people. Everyone in the group is a non-Christian except for the Christian facilitators. There's usually two facilitators, the leader and the co-leader and they facilitate the discussions. Now, what's really cool about this is that the non-Christians outnumber the Christians. That means it's going to be safe for the non-Christians. Most of the time when we do evangelism, we do evangelism in such a way that the Christians outnumber the non-Christians so that we feel safe. What if you were to provide an avenue for non-Christians to feel safe in the evangelism process? Now, let me just hit the, hit the pause button for a second. Uh, got to give you a little bit of background from where I'm coming from. I became a Christian when I was 10 years old. I grew up in a Christian home. I was passionate about sharing my faith when I was 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. I shared my faith all throughout high school and college and beyond. I've been passionate about evangelism. And I have tried every possible way you can think of to do evangelism. I've done uh, uh, evangelism with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, where we did cold turkey evangelism. Have you, do you all know what I mean when I say cold turkey evangelism? You go to Fort La Lauderdale Beach during the spring break, and you go up to complete strangers and ask them if you can talk to them about spiritual things, and start conversations that way, the cold turkey evangelism. I've done open-air preaching, where I go to college campuses and just start preaching and uh, start to gather a crowd and talk about my faith that way. I've passed out tracts. I've invited people to churches and to, to outreach events. I have done preaching myself evangelistically. But this approach that I'm talking to you right now, I have found to be the most effective. I have found that most Christians can actually engage in this. And it's really powerful. Lee Strobel conducted a study at Willow Creek when we launched one of these, uh, launched these groups at Willow, and he found that 80% of the non-Christians that stayed in the groups converted to Christ, became Christians. That's an incredibly powerful evangelism tool. And so I've been dedicating my life to helping facilitate these groups as well as to helping Christians facilitate these groups. And so I'm very passionate about it, as you can tell. Okay, so now look at, look at the, a little bit more detail about this approach. First uh, distinctive is that it's a safe place for non-Christians to really seek. It is a safe place for non-Christians to really seek. Think about this, and Rich was alluding to this, where can non-Christians go where they get to do all the talking? Where they get to ask their questions and voice their objections and observations? Very few places does the church provide where they get to do the talking, where they get to voice their objections. 
Um, I used to joke with Bill Hybels. I was on staff at Willow Creek for 18 years, and I used to joke with him. If a non-Christian came to our service, and a lot of them did, and they raised their hand in the middle of his sermon and said, I doubt that, I have a question about it, we'd have undercover security guards that would usher them out and ban them from the services. Because that was not the place for them to ask their questions. And so I would say to Bill, where can non-Christians go where they get to ask questions? Where they get to, to talk and tell their story? And, and to express their doubts. There aren't very many, few pla there aren't very many places, but there is this secret small group, this spiritual discovery group where they can do that. And you know what I found? Non-Christians love to talk about spiritual things. They used to always like talking to Christians about spiritual things because Christians do all the talking. In these groups, the non-Christians do all the talking. The Christians are taught to ask questions. The Christians are taught to listen more than you talk. We help people make spiritual discoveries for themselves. And that's the second bullet point there. It's a process for non-Christians to self-discover biblical truths. This is not a one and done, a one time, hit them with the gospel and then walk away, like talking to complete strangers. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. God can definitely use us in that. But this is a process that's ongoing. This is where we meet on a regular basis, and we help them to self-discover spiritual truths. And let me just give you a few of the logistics about this. These groups could meet uh, uh, once a week, or every other week, or once a month. They usually meet for about an hour and 15 minutes, and that's it. They almost always have food associated with the meeting. <laughs> you know, it's coffee, desserts, and that kind of thing. Um, the groups are designed, like I said, between four to six to eight to ten people, somewhere around there. It's like a small group, ten to, to no more than ten to twelve people, because then you want to give everybody a chance to talk. Um, they're ongoing, so they meet from week to week to week or every other week. My mother is leading one in Indiana right now with some of her friends and even some of our relatives, and they meet once a month. And uh, my mom's very hospitable, and I think they come for the desserts and for the drinks, you know, and coffee and so forth. But they come, and, uh, you know, sh she's not an evangelist, and she's not an outgoing type of person, but uh, she started one of these groups. Now, part of the reason I think she started one of these groups is because I dedicated the book to her, so I think she felt obligated. <laughs> But uh, no, but God is using her to engage in these spiritual conversations and she's like amazed. And uh, a couple of things too, like most Christians, when they hear about this concept, uh, most Christians have two pushbacks. And maybe you're thinking this right now in your mind. Number one, they ask, where am I gonna find seven, eight, nine non-Christians who will meet with me on a regular basis? Impossible. In fact, the statistics say the longer you're a Christ follower, the fewer non-Christian friends you have. And so you're probably thinking, where do you get these Christians? Okay, I'll leave one of these, send me the non-Christians, you know? And uh, the second thing they usually push back with is, well, even if I could get non-Christians to meet with me, I wouldn't want to, because I wouldn't know how to answer the questions. Well, we teach you how to find non-Christians, how to build bridges of trust with them, how to earn the right to invite them to a discussion. A one, usually it's invite them to a one-time discussion so they can see what it's like, and then ask them if they want to meet on a regular basis. These non-Christians, if they experience the first meeting the way that I outline in, the, in my temp, I, I give a template for how to facilitate these groups, they want to meet again. They come back with more of the questions. And I have found that non-Christians are the best bringers of other non-Christians, so the group grows. And I have found that you don't have to have all the answers, you just, know, you just need to know how to point them to the answers because you're trying to help them to self-discover spiritual truths. So in a sense, what I'm saying is that you sort of get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do the work of conversion. You're just facilitating discussion. You're asking the key questions. You're pointing them to what the Bible has to say and letting them discuss it. For these people, sometimes it's the first time they've ever discussed the Bible because they never really found a place where they could do that, okay? Uh, a couple other bullet points. It's a built-in excuse for ongoing spiritual conversations. Here's the beauty of these groups. There's two things that really stand out in my mind that are really powerful. One is it's a built-in excuse to talk about spiritual things on an ongoing basis. So think about this for a minute. When you are thinking about evangelism and you think about sharing your faith, let's say you've, you've found a non-Christian and you're starting to build a friendship with them and you start to have a great spiritual conversation. My question is this, how do you pick up the conversation where you left off the next time you see the person? 
Sometimes it's really hard. It's hard to start up a conversation about spiritual things. And it's even harder to pick it up where you left off. But when you lead one of these groups and you say, our group is meeting every other Friday night like they did in my neighborhood. We had a group from my neighborhood. We met every other Friday night. They couldn't, they, they've got like a built-in appointment or built-in excuse where they're gonna talk about spiritual things. They can't wait for the next group to meet. Last uh, distinction I wanna make, it's the simple step-by-step -step plan anyone can follow. The thing that's probably amazed me the most is I've taught people how to facilitate these groups over the years. Like I said, I was, at, I was the evangelism pastor at Willow Creek for 18 years, and every, uh, all, each of those years we would launch these groups. At one point we had 110 of these spiritual discovery groups that were meeting at the same time in different locations all around Chicago. Some would meet at the church, some would meet at a Starbucks, some, play, some groups would meet in people's workplaces. Um, they meet everywhere, in people's homes, in the neighborhoods, and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I, I used to think, wow, the evangelists, the people that have the gift of evangelism, or the apologetics experts like Rich, uh, those people would be the best spiritual discovery group facilitators. They're not. Sorry, Rich. Sorry. <laughs> Why is that? Why do you think they wouldn't make the best facilitators of these groups? Why? A little intimidating. They want to talk. Do you need to give her, give her a prize? That's exactly right. They have all the answers and they, they have a tendency. I used to have to take, at Willow Creek, I had to take the gifted evangelists and all the apologetics experts like Rich into a separate room and teach them how to shut up and listen. You know? Good luck with that. <laughs> a special class just for Rich. And, uh, no, I love Rich so much, that's why I can joke about him, because he, he makes me laugh all the time. So now I'm trying to make him laugh. Yeah, there but, anyway, um, but yes, so but the, 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 what surprised me the most were the Christians who had come to my class intimidated, scared to death, didn't have an evangelism gift in, a, in their body or in their bones. They did not have a lot of apologetics knowledge, just, I'm thinking of my mom, like, but they were humble and they would listen and ask questions, and they loved non-Christians. And I, I liked, when I would see non-Christians cross the line of faith in these groups, I like to say, I never talked them into the kingdom, I listened them into the kingdom. I just figured out a way to ask them questions so that they could stumble upon the answers and say, oh, I've never seen this before, I didn't know this was in the Bible, oh, aha. You know, have, have you ever been in a group where you have an aha moment? Where people say, "Aha! I've never, I never thought of that before. Wow, that's making sense. There's something powerful about being in a group where you kind of discuss your questions and your, obs your obstacles and your doubts, and you hear what others are saying, and you begin to make progress. That happens in Christ with Christians. That's why we have these small groups for, for Christians. Can you imagine what it's like to have a group with non-Christians where they start to make spiritual discoveries and they have aha moments? That's what happens when you lead one of these groups. And then watch this. When someone crosses the line of faith in that group and gives their life to Christ, like Kim did in our group, it's the most powerful thing to watch because you've got six or seven other non-Christians who are watching God at work in someone else's life that's in the group. And they say, I want what she has. And so that's why there's 80% conversion rate in these groups is they, they see God at work they're, they're, they're studying the Bible, they're wrestling with what the Bible has to say, the Holy Spirit's working through their hearts, and they're meeting on a regular basis, because a lot of times, people who, who have doubts, they don't convert after one you know, event, like a Billy Graham crusade, and I have the highest respect for Billy Graham, but I'm not a Billy Graham, so it takes time, and it's process, and so forth. All right, I know I'm, I kinda, kinda made you take a drink out of a fire hydrant right now, but, uh, I want to see what kinds of questions do you have since you're all going to lead one of these groups, right? Right? Yes. Okay. Um, what questions do you have for me? Let's take a couple of questions and then I want to show you a video, a couple of video clips of uh, non-Christians who are a part of this uh, process uh, and have you hear from them firsthand. Yes. Uh, this this approach, yes, it, it's definitely an approach that you could utilize 
for both for a group that's mixed with non-Christians and Christians. Now, students, again. students. and yes, some of like uh, somebody was asking me this other other day. Like I've led these groups for high school students, junior high, um, you know, younger singles, and all that, and, and adults. And the, my favorite group to lead this with is high school students. <laughs> it was unbelievably awesome when I did it. Did it with high school students. They're so open and and have all these questions and they've never really felt safe to ask these kinds of questions. They have a lot of doubts and so forth. But my recommendation would be that uh, if possible, and I know it's not always possible, to have a group that's made up mostly of non-Christians because that's when they really feel safe. Unfortunately, when you have Christians that are in the group, they they are not at the same place with the non-Christians. They're like, their real questions are different. They want to grow and they want to ask theological questions and that kind of thing. And the non-Christians aren't there yet. So you have two different uh, audiences. So that's why there's so much power, power in separating them if possible. I know that's not always possible, but great question. Yes. Oh, so awesome. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that they have place for her to go. Aren't you? Yeah. Thank you so much. That's very encouraging. Yes, actually, help them uh, write that curricula. And Gary, uh, Gary, would you just do a brief summary for the recording purpose of what she said? And oh, I'm asked? sorry. Yeah. So this is being recorded. It is being recorded. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's see, let's rewind the tape. Did I say anything that I shouldn't have? But anyway, um, no, so she's saying that uh, Andy Stanley's church, the starting point, uh, has a, it's a program designed for seekers, doubters, to go, and her uh, daughter-in-law is in the group and seeking, and she had committed all six weeks, and it's a program, and I was just gonna mention that, that there are lots of different applications of this very concept that I'm talking to you about. I'm talking to you about a generic approach of, of small group evangelism. The applications are starting point, through uh, North Point, and Alpha through Nikki Gumbel, if you've ever heard of Alpha. There's uh, all kinds of other, th other groups, Christianity Explored, there's all kinds of curricula out there that's designed for non-Christians. The uh, important thing though is that you know how to utilize that stuff uh, for non-Christians. I have a series called Tough Question Series that you can use. All right, one other question, yes, right there. Yeah, uh, so the question is, have we ever had to deal with hostility? Um, you know, uh, very rarely. Um, part of it is that we teach people how to invite people that are really seeking, that are really kind of open. And uh, I didn't go through that, but the bottom page is the steps to starting the group. You know, there's uh, six steps, and it's all in my book, too. But one of them is to build bridges of trust and to invite people that are open and we teach people how to invite them. And what we do though, the reason we, th there isn't a lot of hostility is we say this is a group where we're open. We're open to hear, it's a group where you provide unconditional acceptance and no judgment. And you say, we want you to feel the freedom to, to say whatever you think. And, but then we also say, we're gonna point you to what the Bible has to say and have you discuss it and tell us what you think it means and do you believe it or not? And what do you think of it, you know? And you're going to see this from the videotapes, how they begin to make pros progress in their uh, discoveries, you know, uh, spiritual things. I saw your hand up. Um, what do you do when you're having it and they ask you a question you don't know? Oh, I love that. So did you all hear a question? She says, what do you do when they're asking a question when you don't know how to answer the question? What would you guys say? Get back to you next week. That's awesome. Yes? I don't know the answer, but there is, one. There is an answer, and I will get it. I love that. I don't know. I, I love those words. I do not know. If a non-Christian heard a Christian say that, they would have so much respect for you. And you'd say, well, let me get back to you. Yes? Ding, ding, ding. Give her a prize. That is Awesome, that's exactly what I just did just now. Did you see what I just did? She asked me a question, I didn't know how to answer it. And I said, how would you guys answer it? And you guys answered it way better than I would have. You do that in spirit, you could lead one of these spiritual discovery groups. Because when somebody asks you a question you don't know, you go, that is a great question. I don't know the answer, I have to get back to you. But what about, what about the rest of you? What do you? How would you guys answer it? Now, here's one little tip, I gotta watch the clock. 
Um, uh, one little tip is when you lead one of these spiritual discovery groups where, where everybody in the group is a non-Christian, you have to get used to one thing. You know what it is? Heresy. It's where, non you, here's a wake-up call. Non-Christians don't think the way Christians do. They don't have theology lined up like Christians. Otherwise, they'd be Christians, right? So when you ask them, what do you think about God? What, do you think he exists? Do you think, what, what is God like? You're going to hear in your group eight different non-Christians, eight different answers, and they're all her heretics. They're all, it's not, some of it's kind of right, some of it's not, some of it's really off the wall. And you're, you're going to say, well, i, I got to correct that. you got to say, that was wrong. Why would you think that? That was wrong. That was wrong. All day long, or the whole hour, you're going to say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. That's where you got to be able to give up correcting people and say, that's interesting. Here's what the Bible has to say. What do you think the Bible says? And do you agree with it? And, and it's a process. And we teach this. It's based on a Socratic method. Socrates would teach that way and help people self-discover spiritual truths. Okay, so let's show a quick video and see what you think of this. Uh, so here are the, the options. options. So somebody pick one of these options. There are six video clips. They're about two minutes long. There's one where non-Christians talk about the Bible, about resurrection, about a question that they have for God. Uh, on God, there's one about spiritual conversations in general, and one's on the afterlife. Somebody tell me which one you want here. Watch. Afterlife? Okay, let's, I've heard afterlife a couple times, so let's watch that. Let me ask you, what happens after you die? Uh, do you believe in a heaven and a hell? Do you believe there's life after death? What's your, what's your viewpoint of that? I'm going to go first so I can let these guys disagree with me here in just a couple of seconds. Um, I've always been of the opinion that when you die, and I'm going to depress all of you, that we get buried in the ground and that's about the end of our journey. As much as I hate to say it, as depressing as it sounds, um, I feel like it makes what I do in this lifetime more important. And I, I really do hope at the bottom of my heart that after this life I'm finished because this life has been way more than I can handle. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine doing it over again. Yeah. See, I absolutely believe that our soul lives on after our body dies, our physical body. It may stay here, but our soul lives on. I, I just ca I cannot even imagine that this is it. Yeah. Our lifetime is such a short, short period that we have to have so much more for our souls to accomplish. Yeah. Just because I believe that, you know, we get buried in the ground and that's the end of it does not mean that's what I want to believe. Mm. Um, I desperately want to believe that I can, you know, have a soul that goes on to something so much greater than what I've done in this life. However, I can't bring myself to believe that. So it, it's constantly sort of an inner struggle um, between what I want to believe and what I think actually happens. Anybody else, Brian? You know, I don't believe in necessarily a heaven or hell. I definitely believe that, you know, we each have an energy within us that, you know, continues on and how you live your life in a, in a good or bad way and that energy that you carry continues on in that same direction. I'm a lot on his side. It's kind of an all-pervading energy. Um, and so it can't be something that disappears when we die. Um, it's something that continues on in the world and you, where, where it goes, how that is transferred, and how that continues on in the world, I'm very unsure. This was during a church service in Littleton, Colorado. I had a panel of non-Christians. I was trying to model how to facilitate a discussion with non-Christians, and they were willing to do it in front of a whole church. And but you, could you see how much they were willing to talk? and open up and share their opinion, and they were blown away. They couldn't believe a church even cared about what they thought. It would laugh at them. They were, they were like, when I met with them ahead of time, they are like, are you sure people aren't gonna walk out or stone us or throw tomatoes at us? Are you sure it's safe? They wanna know, is this safe? Can we really share what we really think? I think this is something that Jesus would do. Jesus was a friend to non-Christians, you know? He was a friend of people who were far from God and he would invite them into a conversation, and that's what we're doing here. Yes? Um, so I have two questions. First, when was this filmed? This was filmed about uh, two years ago. Oh yes, yeah. 
and we did, this was edited so you could see a shorter version too, and, but, uh, uh, you know, in a group like that, you'd say, what are you hoping for? And, 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 and then you didn't see it too, but I gave them a reference of what the Bible teaches about life after death. And so they were kind of responding to that too as well. So yeah. Uh, yeah, what are your questions? Yeah. Yes, it does work that way too. Um, and uh, you know, I come from Chicago, where um, a lot of people there's a lot of people that have a Catholic background, and they'll say, "Well, I'm not an atheist. I'm not, uh, you know, Buddhist. I'm I'm a Christian." So they would say, "I'm just a Christian. I'm an American Cubs fan, apple pie eating Christian." And, uh, and so evangelism is really hard in those contexts because they already think they're Christian for the wrong reasons. So you, your evangelism is a two-part process to convince them that they're not a Christian when they think they are and then to show them what it really means to be a Christian. And I have a whole discussion guide designed ex specifically for those people. And it's in my Tough Questions series. Yeah, I saw the hand. Yes, I love diverse groups. Now, I've done groups when I did my high school groups. I did all freshmen. I did a group for sophomores, all juniors, all seniors, and that was awesome. And that was powerful. But I've also had a lot of groups. Some of my favorite, all-time favorite groups were the very diverse groups, mixed groups, you know, married, singles, older, younger, the whole thing. And that, oh, that was really cool to watch that group bond. Um, yes. Well, we have a whole, we teach small group dynamics. Repeat we teach that question. Oh, yes, she's asking, um, uh, oh, I could make up any question I want. How do you, um, <laughs> how do you she, assure that the group clicks? She asked, where, where do I get my books? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, she, she uh, Amazon. So anyway, uh, she said, uh, how do you make sure the group clicks? It's group dynamics. We teach group dynamics. We use a lot of icebreakers and we get people to feel comfortable. The first question we ask when we have our first meeting, we have a whole template in the book on how to do the first meeting, but we have a bunch of icebreakers. They're laughing, they're connecting. You know, one of the icebreakers is, do you squeeze the toothpaste tube in the middle or do you roll it from the end? And what are reasons for your method? And they all debate about that and they're all laughing and finding commonality and all connecting. And, and then we'll ask them other icebreaker questions and then we'll ask them this. If you could ask God one question and you knew he would answer you right now, what question would you ask God? And then they all, they, they go around, they share their question, and I'll have people say, I would like to know why God allows evil and suffering in the world. I'd like to know why God allows so many different religions. It's so confusing. How do you know which one's right? I'd like to know if there's life after death. I'd like to know how can I be sure I'm going to go to heaven? Now, if you're facilitating these groups, and you guys are going to facilitate one of these groups, right? There's one thing you don't want to do, and what's that? You don't want to answer the question, because it'll short circuit the self-discovery process. You don't want to say, hey, I can tell you why God allows evil and suffering. He created us with a free will, and we all chose to reject God and go our own way, and now we're suffering the consequences. No, that's the theologically correct answer, but that'll shut down the self-discovery process. You want to ask them a follow question to the question, why does God allow evil? You know what the follow question is? Why? Why did you ask that question? I'm so curious. That is a great question. You get them lot, give them lots of affirmation. You give them lots of appreciation. Thank you for asking that question. Out of all the questions you could have asked God, you picked that question. I'm kind of curious. Why did you ask that question? You know, you get usually get the heart or the emotion behind their intellectual question. They start sharing about how their mother passed away of cancer, and they want to know why did God allow that. And you start to help people feel heard and understood. And they feel valued. And all this time up to this point, they never felt valued by Christians. They would be given the theological two cent answer to their, to their million dollar question. And so here's a group where they feel loved. They feel, sorry, I'm, I'm just thinking of people that I actually felt for the first time understood why they had doubts because they had to go through some difficulties in their life and no one asked them about that. And you have a chance to facilitate a group to help people feel loved unconditionally by Jesus Christ, by listening to what their questions are. Whew, 
Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But one question that came up was what, you know, in asking questions, why did you ask the question? I looked at that as to an answer to bring the discussion quicker. Uh, and then I'm asking, why am I closing down the discussion? And who do I have to keep records of all the questions that are raised <laughs> so that you don't offend them by not answering the questions? Right. We, we teach all of these details in the book. Seriously, I actually t teach, I say, say to the group so that they know what you're writing down and say, hey, these are great questions that you have for God. I'm going to write these down so I don't lose track of them. And when you invite, I'll give you one quick tip. He's standing up. That means we're over, over time. Um, don't worry, I'll, I'll end. Um, um, but uh, you write down their questions, and you, you, when you invite them, you invite them to come just one time. So in that first meeting, you have their questions, and you say, hey, would you guys like to meet again? Because if we do, we could take your questions and put them in a chronological order, and each time we meet, we'll discuss one of your questions. Now, all of a sudden, the curricula that you're going to walk them through is a curricula customized by them. It's their questions. So you're not taking some other cur curriculum and shoving it down their throat. You're saying, hey, you designed the curriculum. Would you want to come? You know what they usually say? 99.9% .9 of the time they say, are you kidding? Meet again? Of course I want to meet again. And we're going to pick my question next. You know, it's awesome. Well, these are some of the uh, videos that we have available as a part of the Room for Doubt project. Now, the books and things that Gary's been talking about, those are excellent resource materials that can be used in conjunction with this Room for Doubt series. So these sermon bumpers and all other kind of teaching videos, in fact, Mark uh, Middleberg and Gary have done about a half hour leadership training video specifically as a part of this Room for Doubt enterprise. So anyway, Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. If you would like some sample materials in print form of this six-week series, we have a limited number of those up front. Uh, now, you can download the samples free of charge off of the website. You can get them there, but if you'd like to have a printed version of that before you go, you can pick those up here. If you have any additional questions, feel free to hang around. We've got another session starting at 4 o'clock. But thank you so much for joining us this Thanks, afternoon. Everybody.